The subdivisions of the cranium that we talked about before were the anterior cranial fossa, the middle, middle cranial fossa, and the posterior cranial fossa. So the anterior uh, con contains the frontal lobes and it extends backwards to around the middle of the skull, uh, just anterior to the middle of the skull, which would be the, the lesser wings of the sphenoid bone. Uh, so looking back up here, uh, that would be again the frontal portion. The anterior portion, the middle portion goes from that point back to the apex of the petrous ridges. So again back up here, looking at the apex of the petrous ridges right along in uh, this area here. <clears throat> and then uh, everything past that would be the posterior cranial fossa. So that portion there where uh, different cerebral structures are is not going to be stressed on the test. Uh, skull morphology, though, we're, we need a working knowledge of, of the different types and orientation shapes of the skull. So skull morphology is that, just that. You've got three basic skull types, and it is the the three types are basically a round skull an oval skull and then a very elongated oval skull so when we're looking at the skull i'm going to go back up here to this axial image <clears throat> what we're uh, really the the fundamental difference between uh, visually the the different types of skulls and how it affects our positioning is really the angulation of the petrous ridges. So in an average skull, what we have is an angulation of about 47 degrees in the angulation and the orientation of those petrous ridges to each other. So uh, a mesocephalic skull would be a skull where you've got about a 47 degree angle between those ridges, and that's most of your patients. A brachycephalic skull is a very rounded skull and you see brachycephalic skulls characteristically in patients with Down syndrome. Um, they have a very round head. So it's, it's less oval, more round, and what that does is it takes a, those angulation of the petrous ridges from 47 and it pushes them to about 54 degrees. So um, it's much broader base for those petrous ridges. Instead of being here, they'd be more laterally. So it would be a, a much more broad uh, appearance to the petrous ridges. In a patient with a uh, elongated uh, oval shaped skull, it's what you call a dolichocephalic skull, petrous ridges are at 40 degrees. So what you've got there is the difference between average and a round skull as being 7 degrees and then between average and a, a very elongated oval skull is seven degrees as well. So a mesocephalic skull is 47 degrees, brachycephalic skull is 47 plus seven at, at 54 degrees, and then a dolichocephalic skull is, is 47 degree, mesocephalic skull minus seven degrees. So 40, 47, 54, if you remember 57 degrees is your average, and then the other two is the other two are seven degrees above or below that. You should be able to uh, memorize that fairly easily. So the frontal bone, individual bones now, frontal bone has a vertical portion. That's what we call a frontal squama. And it's got a horizontal portion. A horizontal portion is what uh, is right above the, the orbits. The frontal squama forms the forehead and the anterior portion of the cranial vault. Um, and that also contains the frontal sinuses. The landmarks for the frontal bone would be the frontal eminences, the supraorbital margins, uh, the supraorbital arches, supraorbital foramina, and the glabella. So the, from the image, we've got the frontal squama, frontal eminence, uh, the forehead itself, and then we've got the superciliary arches, we've got the super, uh, supraorbital foramen, and then we've got the glabella and then what would be the nasion if we had nasal bones attached to them. So frontal sinuses again are found inside of the vertical portion 
of the uh, frontal bone and articulates the frontal bone articulates with the right and left parietals also articulates with sphenoid bone also artic articulates with the ethmoid bone if you remember the ethmoid bone comes up through that horizontal portion uh, we already talked about the nasal bones and then the zygoma you've also got a, an attachment there as well the zygoma is your cheekbone so your ethmoid bone, we took a look at it, and the only portion of it that we really could see was right through the top of the, uh, the very top of it through the, the horizontal portion of the sphenoid, uh, the, the ethmoid bone. Again, the only portion that we took a look at was the very top of it, which was coming through the horizontal portion of the frontal bone but it consists of a horizontal plate, a vertical plate, and then it consists of two light spongy masses that we call the labyrinth. You have ethmoid sinuses as well, and they're found within those labyrinths. And what you've got in the ethmoid sinuses are uh, individual sinuses unlike the rest of the sinuses. What I mean by that is you, you're probably gonna have two of every other sinus. You're probably gonna have two uh, sphenoid sinuses, although you may have one. You're probably going to have uh, two frontal sinuses. You're definitely going to have two maxillary sinuses, but your ethmoid sinuses are going to be individual small sinuses, in, and they may range in numbers from 4 to 16 or some ridiculous number like that. So you got a lot of different ethmoid sinuses. They're, the uh, ethmoid bone is located between the orbits. Um, and it forms part of the anterior cranial fossa. It forms a portion of the nasal cavity, the orbital walls, and the bony nasal septum. And again, the horizontal portion is called the cribriform plate. Because of its location, you, know, you can get a sinus infection just almost anywhere, but because of its location, whenever you get those sinus infections, headaches, uh, and they seem to be right behind your eyes, Sometimes that's going to be suspicious of sinus infections and ethmoid sinuses. So in the cribriform plate, you got a lot of holes, and that's where your olfactory nerves go through. That crest galley we talked about, and that just means the crest of the rooster, and that's a, that pointy portion that sticks up um, through the, the horizontal portion of the frontal bone. And then you've got the perpendicular plate. That's the vertical portion and it uh, is continuous again all the way down with a bony nasal septum. <clears throat> Labyrinths, we talked about that, contains ethmoid air cells. Uh, the, the walls form a part of the medial walls of the orbits and the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. And you got these two little thin bones. All right, So those little thin bones, if I can get back up to a frontal view, I'll show you what those bones are. They are these little scroll looking bones in here. You can see four of them hanging down here. And what those are, <coughs> are um, the what we refer to as two things. One being the turbinates. And you can imagine why they're called turbinates because they, they are kind of in a, you know, a, a turbulent type orientation. They kind of twist around and they are also referred to as the uh, superior and middle conch uh, bones and plural of conch is conchy. So uh, C-O-N-C-H-A-E is conchy. So the if you think of a conch bone that you might pick up a uh, conch bone is that bone that they use in like island ceremonies to blow into it. It kind of sounds like a horn. So those are conch shells. And if you were to take an x-ray of one of those or if you were to cut it and look inside of it, then what you would find is that they have that same scroll appearance on the inside of the conch shell. And that's how they get their name is because they're kind of formed like a conch shell or uh, you know, a, a, something that, that would twist around, turn air, kind of like a, a turbine engine. 
So the ethmoid bone, it articulates with the frontal bone, the sphenoid bone, the lacrimal bone. A lacrimal bone is a very small bone on the inside of the orbit. So it, it articulates with the nasal bones. It's just posterior to the nasal bones, and it's right there where those tear ducts are on the inside of your eye. And that's why it's called a lacrimal bone is because the lacrimal duct comes through there. And you've got the maxilla, which is your, um, your, the uh, upper jaw, essentially. And then your vomer um, is on the inside of your nose as well, nasal cavity. So it looks like that. And it kind of looks like a small bat. you got the top portion being the crista galli, and then you've got the, uh, the turbinates over here on both sides. And I prefer turbinate over conky. So I'm going to use turbinate. Um, if you prefer conky, then just make the transition. Whenever I say turbinate, just understand I'm talking about this same thing. So you've got the uh, superior, and then you got the middle, and then you've got the perpendicular plate here. And then you you see how it is that you've got these individual small little bitty uh, air cells being your ethmoid air cells. So looking at it from the side, we've got the crista galli again, and we've got the crib, cribriform plate, and then we've got the uh, the um, perpendicular plate, and then this is continuous with the uh, vomer, and this uh, articulates with the, the cartilage of the nasal septum. So your parietal bones are somewhat square. Uh, they have a little bit of a convex external surface and concave on the inside. They've got a little bit of a parietal eminence. If you put your hands on your temples and then push up towards the top of your head, you'll feel where they, they kind of uh, take a, a transition from more vertical to more horizontal. And that would be that prominent bulge that is referenced here. And that should be about the widest portion of the skull um, for whenever techniques are set off the technique chart. It artic they articulate with each other. Parietal bones articulate with each other at the sagittal suture. They articulate with the frontal bone at the, at the coronal suture. Um, they articulate with the occipital bone and sphenoid bones on the posterior side. So it really doesn't have a whole lot of prominent features. Probably the most prominent thing about the parietal bone is its lack of prominence. It really isn't going to play a part in skulls, but whenever we get into um, facial bones and mastoids and TMJs and mandibles and, and some of the projections and, and some of the procedures that we do where we need uh, consistency, then what we're going to do is kind of the same thing that we did whenever we were uh, learning about imaging the sternum. We did a, the RAO um, of the sternum in order to project the heart shadow over the sternum itself because the heart was pretty uniform in density. Um, and oblique and put the heart, the shadow of the heart directly over the sternum uh, gave us a consistent density to put over the top of it. And we're going to use parietal bones in the same way. So some of the projections that we're going to use, the intention is to either project the parietal bones onto the anatomy or to project the anatomy onto the parietal bones and get it off of all this other stuff that uh, would interfere with the appearance of the anatomy. <clears throat> what I mean by that is below, right down below this portion right here, what you've got is the uh, the TMJ. So if we project the TMJ over this uh, Petrus portion, we're not going to see much of anything. Uh, but if we project the parietal bone directly over that TMJ, then we're more likely to see it than, than trying to project it on some of this screwy bone that we've got in other portions of the skull. And it, so it looks like that. You, the only thing that you've got going on there is a square bone, really flat. It's got one eminence that you really can't make out on uh, a lateral view of the skull very well at all. The sphenoid bone, we've talked about a lot of this, but uh, just running back through it. That sphenoid bone is very much irregular shaped bone. It's kind of wedge shaped. Um, and it 
vaguely re resembles, I don't know, more maybe a, a bat in flight. But it's located in the base of the cran cranium, anterior to the temporal bones. And it consists of a body, and then you've got two lesser wings, two greater wings. Again, that PTER is always going to be associated with the sphenoid bone. So you got two uh, pterygoid processes. Uh, the body contains the sphenoid sinus, and that's right up under the cella turcica. The cella turcica is just a deep depression on the superior surface. It's on top, and it houses the pituitary gland. And it's located in the mid-sagittal plane, um, three-quarters of an inch anterior and superior to the EAM. So that's your ear hole. So if, um, if you're looking for the cella turcica itself, and we do have specialty views just of the cella turcica itself, then your positioning would be right there. It would be three quarters of an inch superior to and three quarters of an inch anterior to the EAM, basically to the temple. So the tuberculum cella is the anterior portion. Uh, you've got the anterior clinoid processes. I pointed that out on the axial image before. You got the dorsum cella being the posterior portion. You got posterior clinoid processes, and, and I pointed those out as well. <clears throat> the clivus is that slanted portion that's posterior, and, and a line from the clivus is continuous with the, the occipital bone. And if you remember back to C spines, we talked about the importance of being able to image the clivus on a lateral C-spine to evaluate whether or not we've got that anterior ligament, um, whether or not we've got some sort of disruption of that ligament. So you got an optic groove that extends across the anterior portion of the tuberculum, tuberculum cella and it ends on each side of the optic canal. The optic canal is an opening. It is at the apex of the orbit. Now the orbit is not a single bone. Um, you know, you may hear somebody got hit in the eye and they broke their orbital bone. There is no orbital bone. Um, it's a structure containing or made up of, of several different bones. So uh, the optic canal is at the posterior portion of that, um, of that orbit um, all the way at the back, and we'll we'll talk when we get into orbits ab about how we can image the optic canal itself. So the optic canal is uh, termed the optic foramen. Again, you've got the lesser wings, you've got the greater wings. You got the pterygoid process. Uh, you got the three paired foramina on both sides. You got the rotundum, the ovale, and the spinosum. Um, and then you've got the sphenoid that articulates with all of the other bones of the cranium and the zygoma. So, from a superior portion, this is what it looks like. Again, we've got the lesser wing, we've got the greater wing, we've got the posterior clinoid processes, we've got the anterior clinoid processes. You can't really see the optic foramen. Uh, it's kind of tucked up under here. If we're back in class on Monday, uh, they're calling for some maybe as much as eight inches of snow on Monday, and that's why I'm, I'm uh, doing this at home. But uh, if we happen to be in class on Monday, I'll show you, you know, the optic canal from the orbit and also from the the sphenoid bone as well. This is definitely the most complicated drawing of any of the cranial bones and it's because it's at an oblique so why they didn't just give us a, a lateral view of the sphenoid bone I can't really tell you but what you see if you can kind of wrap your mind around this is you've got the the anterior clinoid processes at a bit of an angle and then you've got the posterior clinoid processes so it's as if this patient was turned into a true lateral, and then, whenever you went back to make your image, the patient turned their face towards the image receptor. So it'd be as if this is the left side over here, elevated side is the right-hand side, so left-hand side is up against the bucky, and they turned their face towards the bucky. I don't know why they did this. This has always been the most confusing view
uh, confusing drawing uh, in skulls and maybe in the the uh, textbook themselves. So what we've got are the pterygoid hamulus, pterygoid processes. We've got the dorsum cella back here. We've got the posterior clinoid process, processes. We've got the anterior clinoid processes. That would be your cella tersica in there. The, um, the sphenoid sinus would be right up underneath. And then we've got lesser wings and greater wings. So your occipital bone is situated on the posterior inferior portion of the cranium and it forms the posterior half of the cranial base and the greater portion of the posterior cranial fossa and it has four parts. Squama just means flat part, two occipital condyles and that's where you get rotation of the skull and articulation with the upper portion of the C-spine and you get the basilar portion <clears throat> and you've got the foramen magnum and then you've got your external occipital protuberance, which is also called your inion. Um, don't confuse your inion with your goinion. All right, let me go back up here to a lateral view. Um, the goinion is the angle of the mandible right here. Okay, so inion's back here. Goinion is this thing right here. Talked about the occipital condyle just a moment ago, so we're going to skip over this slide and we're going to take a look at the occipital condyles and the, the, the external view of the occipital bone. So we have the squamous portion, which is a flat portion. We have the external occipital protuberance that's not on the back of your head, it's also known as the, the inion. We have the uh, condylar canal. We've got the basilar portion, which reaches forward to join up with eventually the cella tersica. And we've got the occipital condyles for rotation on uh, C1 here and here on both sides. So from lateral view, this is also a little bit oblique. We've got the frame of magnum. We've got the inion, the squamous portion, and then the basilar portion there.